I want to preach to you or uh, with you today is about the altar. Amen. Here in the book of Hebrews, we find one of the most positive statements of affirmation, and that is those words that I have put as a title, we have an altar. Um, I believe, church family, as we are entering this brand new year and we're entering all that we might potentially face in 2021, all of the challenges maybe in our culture, all of the challenges that we may face in our families, all of the, the situations that we might possibly be up against, uh, we need to take another look. We need to pause just for a moment and I believe take another look at the altar that we have and that God has made for us so that our lives can be lived out for the Lord. Amen. Uh, let's take a, a look again at what is called the altar. You say, what is an altar? You know, I found it interesting that in the Bible... There are over 400 references to altars in the Bible. If you look up in Webster's Dictionary, now, as far as I know, Webster never preached for us, but he wrote a good book. And Webster defined an altar as this. He said it was usually a raised structure, a place on which sacrifices are offered or they would burn incense in an act of worship. Amen. If you were to go back into the Old Testament, the Old Testament tabernacle, and you were to study this Old Testament tabernacle, you find that in the, the layout, the blueprint of the tabernacle, if you were to walk through the gate of the layout of the outer courtyard and, and then approaching your, into the inner courtyard and into the Holy of Holies, uh, as you entered that whole courtyard, the very first item that you would come to was a brazen altar. Amen. It was the first thing. Everyone say the first thing. It was the very first thing you came to as you entered the courtyard and as you made your way into that courtyard and, and the sacrifices were made at that brazen altar and, and then next the priests would go to what was called the brazen laver and they would wash their hands of the blood from the sacrifice and they would make their way into the inner court and, and, and there was a table that had showbread. Uh, it was the, the bread that was sprinkled with frankincense and, and then there was a menorah, there was a candlestick and it, it was lit and it was burning from oil. And then there was another altar right before the priest would go behind the curtain into that sacred holy of holies. There was a altar of incense and on that altar of incense were the odors of incense that would be burning continually. It was symbolic. It was symbolic of worship. It was symbolic of praise and honor. It was the last piece of furniture before that high priest would go behind the curtain and enter the holy of holies. Amen. It's interesting, just a little point of reference in history, uh, that... That, that altar of, uh, that brazen altar was built of acacia wood. It was five by five and three cubits high. It had horns that projected from the four corners where, where they would bind animal victims. And uh, there would be blood that was shed. And um, 
that that flesh would be killed and it would be preparing themselves to enter the house of the Lord. And then again, once you got into that inner court and that holy sanctum, that holy place, there was this other altar called the altar of incense. In many respects, it was similar to that altar of burnt offering because they were both square in shape. They were both made of acacia wood. They both had horns. They both had rings where they would put poles or staves through them to carry it upon the shoulders of the priests. Amen. And again, at that, that altar of incense in the inner court was situated in the center of the holy place and it provided an altar of incense to God. Amen. This was a perpetual offering. It meant that as long as the Hebrew religion lasted, church, uh, this ritual, this act would continue. Now, you say, what is all this symbolizing? I want to say it again. The very first thing as you enter that tabernacle was an altar. Flesh was killed at that altar. Amen. Uh, very similar to the fact that we have to die to our human nature. We have to die to our flesh as we come to God, as we carry ourselves before the Lord. Uh, we have an altar in our life that God wants us to be able to, to slaughter and crucify this old carnal nature that we have in us. It's a place of death. It's a place of crucifixion. It's a place before we ever get into the presence of God that we have to come to where we die out. Amen. Uh, where we, we have to recalibrate our mind and our focus and our thoughts and say, God, I want to crucify this old, carnal, fallen nature of my life I want to surrender it before you it's an act of surrender it's an act of commitment it's an act of devotion it's an act of consecration and then of course the very last thing before you ever cross that veil and that Old Testament symbol that Old Testament shadow uh, was this altar of incense which is very symbolic of our communion, our worship, our praise, our prayer, and our love to God. Amen. I believe that our prayers and our worship and our praise should be continual. Amen. I believe it should be a continual burning of incense. Amen. We need a prayer life. We need the habit of continual, perpetual, consistent, persistent prayer. Amen. I, I, I want to tell you what Paul told the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul said this in chapter 5, verse 17 and verse 18. Paul said, pray... Without ceasing. In the mind of the apostle. He told God's people. You need to be in a spirit of prayer. Amen. God's intention for his church. For his people. Is we need a mind of prayer. We need to be in a heart of prayer. Praying without ceasing, hear me, praying without ceasing doesn't mean that you are talking 24-7. It means you're in an attitude, in a mindset, in an awareness of God. Amen. 
Uh, You're going through your day, you're working your job, you're doing the dishes, you're folding laundry, you're heading out to the store, but, but your mind is on God. There's an attitude, there's an awareness of, of, of the Lord in your life. Amen. Uh, it's praying without ceasing. Matter of fact, the Lord told us, He said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. Amen. Uh, a church, we have an altar. We have an altar. And matter of fact, in verse number 18, the next verse, it says, In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus uh, concerning you. You say, well, why? Pastor Harris, why do we need this? Well, I think it's obvious, but uh, if we're going to be saved, we need an altar. Amen. We, we need an altar. If you're going to get close to God, you need an altar. Uh, An altar always represented a place of devotion. An altar always represented a place of consecration. It was a place of commitment. It, It represented a person's desire to uh, consecrate themselves fully to the Lord. Amen. Uh, we need an altar of personal devotion. You know, it's easy to go about the, the rush and the hustle and the bustle of life. To get so busy that we forget about our personal commitments. We forget about our personal devotions. Uh, the Old Testament book of Leviticus chapter number 6, verse number 13 says this. The fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Church family, I want to tell you, don't let the fire go out on your family altar. Don't let the fire go out in your heart's altar. Don't let the flame die down. Don't get cold in God. You got to stir up the fire. You may have to put another log on the fire. You may have to warm it up. But let me tell you, we have an altar and we need to fire up the altar. We need the fire to keep going and burning at the altar of our lives. Amen. There's a little hymn that says this, and I like these powerful words from this little hymn. It says, Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you ask for a loving favor as a shield today? Oh, how praying rest to the weary Prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. Amen. We have an altar in our lives. We read a powerful, powerful scripture that I want to put back on the screen there in Leviticus 6.13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Can you... Can you see the priest every morning he tends to the fire? Think, just kind of picture that in your mind. Do you see that priest going out there and, and he kind of strokes the fire? He kind of pokes at the fire. He kind of keeps it going. It, it, it looks like it's starting to die down a little bit. But the priest goes out there in the morning because he's got to make sure the fire is burning. He, he, he wakes up in the morning and he goes and checks and makes sure that the fire hadn't gone out. He strokes it. He prods it a little bit. He pokes at it a little bit or, or however he were to do it. I kind of picture it in my mind. And, and, and maybe in the day, maybe he does the same thing just to make sure it's not dying down. And, and then in the evening before he expires and goes to bed, he wants to make sure the fire's still burning. So that priest goes and makes sure that 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 
fire is burning continually there at the altar. Psalm 63 verse 3 says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Hallelujah. I think it's obvious that the personal altar is the altar of consecration. It's the altar of devotion. It's the altar of commitment to God. It's here at this altar that I open my Bible and I read the Word of God. It's here at this daily altar that I partake of daily bread. We have an altar, church. Amen. I hope you have a daily altar. And I will tell you that if your altar is gone out, today's a day to rekindle it, to re-spark the fire. To put the flame back in it. If your altar has died down and there's not much life left in it. If there's not much fire in it. I want to tell you, you need to stir it. You need to poke at it. You need to prod at it. I'm talking about this fire of devotion in your family. Amen. If you have children, you ought to have a place of daily bread. Amen. You ought to have some... Daily devotion. You ought to have a a family altar. A a place in your home. That is a place of consecration. It's a place of commitment. You know Isaac knew something about an altar. I don't know if you know the story. But I think most of you are aware of the story of Abraham. And uh, Abraham knew something about altars. He built a lot of altars. He prayed at a lot of altars. And God had promised him a son. God gave him that promised son in Isaac. And then God asked him to do something very difficult, very challenging. Uh, Sometimes there's times in our lives that God will ask us to do things that we don't understand. God will ask us to make some commitments that maybe we don't know why. God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him on the mountain, and I want you to prepare for me there a sacrifice. Sacrifice your son. And you know, I I don't know how it all transpired, but somewhere along the way, Abraham had taught his boy about altars. Amen. Somewhere along the way, Abraham had a teaching session. And I don't know how it looked like, but maybe he said, Son... Come sit down here for a little bit. I want to talk to you about altars. I want to tell you how to make an altar in your life. What to do at an altar. You say, how do you know that? Because somewhere as they were climbing that mountain, Isaac said to his father, he said, I I, I don't see, you know, we've we've got the wood, we've got this, but, but, Where's the sacrifice? I mean, you know, from what you taught me, Dad, everything is being prepared for the sacrifice at an altar. But there's some things missing. You see, the only way he knew that is because his dad had taught him something about an altar. Amen. You see, there's what I call common man has a common altar. And every one of us in this room need this. We need to build altars in our homes. Amen. It might be a... uh, I'm talking about a place of prayer. A place of sacrifice. A place of devotion. It might be a coffee table. It might be your bedside. It, It might be another place. It might be the living room couch. Amen. Uh, The altar that I talked about earlier in the tabernacle is not enough. Uh, What we call many times 
at this platform's edge. We often call this an altar. This is not enough. We're here for a little while on a Sunday morning. But you need a daily altar. You need a place in your life. You need a place in your home. You need a place in your family that every day you're coming to God. It's what I call that common altar. Amen. Listen, I I will tell you there is a cost for the altar. It takes time. It takes consecration, just like Abraham taught his son. So we need to teach our sons and our daughters how to build altars. Amen. Hear me, church. We need to pass on to our kids not just how to play baseball, not just how to point a gun and shoot a a deer, not, not just how to play soccer, but we need to teach our kids, our grandkids, how to build altars, how to have a place of prayer, how to have a place of devotion, how to get connected and a hold of God, because this world, the Bible said, will become perilous. And if we don't have an altar, if we don't have a place where we're committed to God, how are we going to survive in this world and in this culture? There's a cost to altars. It takes time to have an altar. It takes consecration to have an altar. If I want a meaningful relationship, let me tell you where it begins. It begins at the altar. Amen. We have an altar available to us. We need to utilize it. We never outgrow altars. Amen. The ceremonial altar that I talked about earlier. This altar of burning. This altar of incense. This brazen altar. These altars were overlaid with, with gold. They were ornate. They were tooled. They were attended by the priest. But I'm talking about this common altar that anybody can build anywhere. You can build an altar at your job. You can find a place of prayer at your workplace. You, you can slip away from the cafeteria and, and go find a place to pray. Amen. You can build an altar at your school uh, you, you, you don't even have to go to the lunchroom if you're in person in classes you can say you know what I'm going to walk to the courtyard and just walk and pray a little bit and you can build an altar we've got to have an altar every single day in our lives in our homes in our families we have an altar amen you can build it Sunday mornings we have an altar. Churches have an altar. But that's not enough. My flesh is alive more than just Sundays. My flesh is alive on Monday. I need an altar. My flesh is alive on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays. I need an altar. My flesh is alive on Fridays and Saturdays. That's why i got to get up in the morning and I've got to somehow make sure the altar is still got fire on it. i got to probe it a little bit. i got to push the flesh down and find a place and say, God, give me this day my daily bread. Lord, I'm coming to a place of prayer. I'm going to meet you in the morning. I'm going to make sure as Leviticus said, there's fire on the altar and then before I go to bed at night I've got to poke that fire a little bit. Why? Because my flesh is alive every day and I need an altar in my life. Somebody said a family altar will alter the family. We need to alter our family. Come on, we can't just rely on a two-hour fix on Sundays. we got to have a daily altar. I'm challenging our church to have an altar in your home, to have a place at your job, to have a place of personal, daily devotion and commitment. It's a place, listen to me church, it's a place where you meet the Lord. The altar becomes a connection 
with God. It's where God speaks to you. It's where you hear the voice of God. Amen. An altar of personal devotion. We need an altar of worship. John chapter 4 verse 23. Can I just share a little bit more with you? Is that all right, church? The Bible says when the, the, the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And I want you to put your eyeballs on the last part of that. The Father is seeking worshipers. Hear me today, church family, on this second Sunday of 2021. Hear me today. My Bible tells me that God is looking for something. He's not looking for just saints. He's not just looking for apostolics and Pentecostals. He's not looking for good people or bad people. He's looking for somebody, anybody, who will worship Him in spirit and truth regardless of their spiritual condition in their life. Listen, the world is filled. Listen to me today. The world is filled with seekers. We've got people looking for treasure. We've got people diving in the ocean looking for hidden treasure and pearls and oysters. We've got people digging for gold. People looking for lost civilizations. We've got people looking for relics. And once in a while we've got people in the, in the news that's looking for a lost animal or a lost pet or whatever it is. It's hard for us to fathom in the 21st century that God is looking for something. God is looking for people that will worship Him in spirit and truth. Listen, I want to tell you, church, on January the 10th, 2021, you've got to become crazy about Jesus. You've got you to make some noise. You've got to stir the fire. You've got to get something moving inside of you. You've got to lift up holy hands. You've got to pray. You've got to press past the flesh. You've got to lift up those hands to God. You've got to open your jaws and worship God. God works with moving objects. Come on, somebody. You need to stir your flesh a little bit. You need to get a hold of your heart a little bit. Come on. God wants some movement. God wants some action. God wants some hands folded, some knees on the floor. God wants some praise extended. God wants some worship given. Let there be some fire that begins to move inside of you that says this year is not going to be like last year. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to have an altar. I'm going to love God with everything that is inside of me. We have an altar. Woo! Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Hallelujah. We serve a God that has eyes that can see, ears that can hear. And He is moved by your love and your devotion and your commitment and your worship. He is moved. When you want to pray and seek the Lord, the Bible said, seek me and you'll find me. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you shall receive. And if you'll seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Come after me. Pursue me because I'm looking. Can I find a worshiper at 309 Lakeview Drive? Can I find a worshiper in Ozaki County? Can I find a worshiper beyond Sunday mornings at 1030? Can I find a worshiper in their home? Can I find a worshiper? in somebody's job that's what I'm looking for I'm, I'm I'm seeking for those that will worship me in spirit and in truth come on somebody hear your pastor today with a burden and a passion we've got to have an altar of worship hallelujah I've been to Mount Rushmore a couple of times And as beautiful as it is, 
those mouths don't open. Those heads don't nod. God's not looking for impersonations of Mount Rushmore. God's looking for people that will open their mouths. People that will lift their hands. People that will worship. People that will sing. People that will magnify the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, understand this isn't a funeral home. This is not a library. This is a church house. We need to worship God, we need to make some noise. We need to say amen. We need to clap our hands. We need to prod the, the fire. We need to stir it up. Come on, somebody, clap your hands unto the Lord. <laughs> Woo! Somebody say amen. amen. And so he said in Genesis 22, verse 5, I am. And the lad will go yonder and worship. Everybody say worship. Where were they going? They were going to the altar. This is the setting again of Abraham and Isaac, Mount Moriah. He's going up there. He's going up there for sacrifice. And you know what he says? I want you to catch this church family. He said, we're going to go up there on that mountain Where there's an altar and we're going to worship. There's no choir. There's there's no drums playing. There's no keyboard strumming. Come on, there's no no Stuart Jones leading us and trying to get us to to, to worship. there's, There's no praise team. He just said, me and that lad are just going to go up there on that mountain and we're just going to worship. Come on, I'm so thankful that we have a a wonderful music ministry that helps enhance our worship. But come on, at the end of the day, you don't have to rely on that to worship. We, We are glad we have it, and I'm thankful we've got an awesome team. But you don't have to have this on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday in your home. You've got to have an altar in your home. You've got to have a place of worship and daily prayer and daily devotion and commitment to God we have an altar and we need it to alter our lives hallelujah praise the name of the Lord listen true worship always entails sacrifice I say sacrifice Hear the words of David, Psalm 84, verse 1 and 2. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts, by so longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Is that the way you feel? You say, man, my heart longs to be at church on Sunday. I long to be in the house of the Lord. I desire to be at an altar. In my home. I can't wait to get up and find that place. That place I've set aside. At the coffee table. At the couch. At the bedside. Wherever it is. Wherever that altar is. I can't wait. My heart longs to find that place of communication. Psalm 84 verse 10. For a day in his courts. Is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper. Thank you brother Rico. In the house of my God, then dwell in the tents of wickedness. Why? Because my heart longs to hear the word of the Lord. My heart longs for an altar. My heart longs to be in the tabernacle. My heart longs to hear the word of God. Psalm 84 verse 1 and 2 says it like this in a different translation. It says, oh, how I love your temple, Lord Almighty. How I want to be there. I long to be in the Lord's temple with my whole being. I sing for joy to the living God. We need an altar. We need an altar of prayer. We need an altar of personal devotion. There's nothing like corporate worship with the body of Christ coming together. That's what we do here. But we also need a a, a place of devotion and commitment every day in our homes. We need an altar of worship. We also need an altar of cleansing. We need a place that we come and we, we lay some things down before the Lord. We sacrifice our heart. You know what happened when Israel rebelled? When Israel rebelled and they fell into idolatry, the Lord's altars fell into disrepair. 
Did you hear me, church? When we fall away from God, when we rebel, when we get cold, when the embers go out, when we lose our commitments, you know what happens to our altars? Our altars fall into disrepair. I want to say it again, and I'm, I'm, I'm hastening to a closing, but we need an altar in our life, and we have one. And you know how it's available? It's available through Jesus Christ. We need an altar of holiness. We need an altar of worship. We need an altar of cleansing. Amen. We discover in the New Testament the word for altar is a word which means a place of sacrifice. It's a high place. In Matthew chapter 5, it was called the altar of the true God. And then in Exodus and Leviticus, it's called the altar of burnt offerings. In Exodus 39, it is the brazen altar. In Malachi 2, it's the altar of the Lord. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane wept as it were great drops of blood before he went to the cross. It was a place of sacrifice. The Bible gives us a picture of an awful place called Golgotha where thieves were crucified and Jesus was pierced in his side where water and blood flowed and his hands and his feet were nailed. Hell was jubilant thinking that the Son of God was fallen. That, that day, if you had been there that day, the Bible said the earth quaked and darkness fell. But I'm going to tell you that the devil had a wake-up call for Jesus had taken the keys to death and hell and the grave and he marched across the arena of the universe leading captivity captive and now he said whosoever will come let him come to the altar to be healed. Let them come to the altar to be delivered. The veil has been rent. Anyone is welcome at the altar of the Lord. If you need healing today. If you need forgiveness today. If you need mercy today. If you need deliverance today. It's at the altar. As our musicians come. God. Wants us to surrender our lives to the control of His Spirit. Many churches have altars for prayer. That's what this is. We call this coming to the altar. We call this an altar. Many churches have altars for prayer. Many churches have altars for communion. Many churches have altars for weddings. Many churches have altars for sacred purposes. However, however, every human heart is an invisible altar where the war between the flesh and the spirit rages. You have an invisible altar, and it's in your heart. God wants you to surrender parts of your lives to the control of His Spirit. In essence, church family and our virtual church family, hear me today from Belgium, Wisconsin. Hear me. In essence, God wants you to lay every area of your life at an altar. So today, as we stand, you and I need to ask God what areas of our lives that God is requiring that we offer today. What area of your life, church, guest, friend, what area of your life is God asking you to lay at an altar today? Hear me today on this Sunday, 2021. Stop looking at the obstacles. Come on, I know there's obstacles all around us. We need to start, start looking at the opportunities that God is giving us. 
It's easy to focus on the negative. It's easy to focus at all the chaos in this world. It's easy to focus on the obstacles of this world. But God wants us to lift up our eyes to see that we have an altar. We have an open door today. We have an opportunity. We can start taking our homes back for God. Don't live in 2020. Don't live in the past. Don't live in all of the things and the challenges that we had in 2020. But look up and say, you know what? This year is going to be different. I'm taking my home back. I'm going to be a leader in prayer. I'm going to find an altar of prayer. I'm going to find an altar of, of, of surrender. What areas of your life? Is God requiring on this Sunday morning that you offer to Him? What's God saying to you today? Here in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to symbolically come to an altar. This is symbolic. When we step from behind the seat, And we walk down here. It is a symbolic gesture that we come forward symbolically surrendering our heart and our lives. But let me tell you, you got to have an altar every single day of your life. Today God is asking us to surrender some things in our life. What is it God is asking you to lay at the altar today? What is it in your home, in your life, in your mind, in your marriage that God is requiring as a personal sacrifice? Altars are all about sacrifice. Sacrifices challenge us. Sacrifices can be painful. Crucifixion hurts. Today, God may be asking us to do something that's a little painful to our flesh. It may hurt a little. But God wants you, if you're willing and you're desiring a closer walk with God, if you're desiring God to do something different this year, would you prepare your heart now? And would you get ready to approach this altar symbolically if you're if if you're not comfortable coming to this altar then I ask you to make that seat an altar amen I, I I every one of us has an invisible altar here if you're watching today make your couch make your living room make wherever you're watching this an altar Let God get a hold of you. God's Spirit is moving here, but no doubt God's moving through the medium of Facebook. God's reaching for some family, some home, some life, some marriage. Come on, don't pass this up. Let the Spirit of the Lord touch you. Let those tears stream down your face. Let your heart be open and yielded. Let the power of God fill you with the Holy Ghost. Let the anointing of God fall on you, church. I don't, I, I, you, you ought to have your hands raised up right now. You ought to have your heart open right now. Now, because God is in this room stirring and moving and ministering. This altar is open. Anybody, if you would feel like God is drawing you to come forward with personal devotion and personal consecration, would you come right now? Would you make your approach? Would you bring that need before the Lord? Come on, I feel the presence of God. I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. A thousand times I feel Come on, that's it in the name of the Lord. Should I stumble again? Still I'm caught in Hallelujah. Come on, spend some time with the Lord right now. Spend some time with God right now. Yes, oh Lord, I love you, I love you, I worship you. I'm just as 
God's asking some of you to lay some things down at the altar right now. That's it. Talk to God right now. Let the Spirit of the Lord challenge you. God, I'm making some commitments. I'm laying some things down right now. I'm consecrating and devoting some things, oh Lord, in my home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Come on, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, I feel the Spirit of the Lord. I feel the Spirit of God. Come on, that's it right now. Every home, every family in Jesus' name. 